Hello and welcome or welcome back to my History of Tarot series. My name is Becca and if you haven't seen part one, the Minor Arcana, or part two, the Major Arcana, I recommend you do so. But if you don't want to, here's a brief recap. Playing cards were invented in China about a thousand years ago. They made their way to Italy in the 1300s, and in the 1400s, Dukes Visconti and Sforza of Milan created the Major Arcana, then called Trump Cards, for playing a newly invented card game. French artists updated the designs into the style we know today as the Tarot de Marseille in the 1600s, but by the 1700s, the game of tarot was falling out of fashion with most of Europe. Which brings us to the topic of today's video. Getting mystical with tarot. Now, before I begin, I want to be clear that divination has been practiced throughout human history, but it's only been very recently that cards have been a part of these divination practices. I've mentioned in the past two videos how very expensive cards were. Well, this is because the cost of the item influences who has access to the item, and for the past thousand years of European history and more recent American history, being a fortune teller hasn't been the most reputable of occupations. Unless you were lucky enough to be employed by an eccentric member of the nobility, most practices of divination were underprivileged members of society and simply didn't have access to luxury goods like gilded illustrated cards. This changed in the 1700s as printing press technology grew and cards became much cheaper. This is probably a good time to talk about the Roma people. There has been a lot of talk recently about Roma tarot traditions and whether all of tarot practice is actually cultural appropriation. There aren't many origin stories of the Roma that have survived, and those that do exist are often completely fabricated, like the medieval story that they came from Egypt, hence the origin of the ethnic slur that is often used to refer to them, which I will not be using. Modern language analysis and DNA testing have allowed us to construct a timeline. It is now accepted that the ancestors of the Roma people originally lived in India. For reasons that are unclear, at some point between 500 and 1000 CE, they began to move westward. By 1100, they had moved through Turkey and the group split, some going north through the Balkans and then through to northwestern Europe, and some going south to Greece, leading to further migrations through North Africa. These two groups would eventually meet again in Spain and France. Reactions by Europeans to the Roma have been, let's say, mixed at best. There have been some times in history where some governments and some monarchies have welcomed them, but mostly they have been persecuted. During the thousand years that the Roma have lived in Europe, they have been banished, enslaved, and even hunted for sport. The first Roma people in the Americas were brought as slaves of Christopher Columbus in 1498. The Roma people are still discriminated against across Europe and in some places in the Americas. They are denied human rights and government services that other citizens take for granted. The first written accounts of the Roma people in Europe come from Greece. In 1322, an Irish monk returning from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem encountered a group of people in Greece that he referred to as the descendants of Cain. Yeah, you know, the biblical bad guy who killed his brother <laughs> Um, not a great start. I also want to say that descendants of Cain is a term often used by white Christians to refer to anyone of a darker skin cone and used as an excuse for racism. This terminology has a widespread long-term use. It was actually used as an excuse for race-based slavery in the Americas. So in 1350, a few years after that first encounter, a German scholar meets a similar group of people. He mentions that they have a strange language and he calls them Mendapolis, which he may have taken from the Greek word montes, which means someone who practices divination. If this is truly the origin of this term, then this is evidence that from the very beginning of the Roma people being known to Europeans, they have been known for their divination practices. 
However, cards were not the divination method of choice. The most common method of divination practiced by the Roma people was palm reading, although other methods such as tea leaf reading or drawing lots and scrying were all also used. It wasn't until the 1800s, well after card reading was established in the general population, that we start to see evidence of the Roma using this in their divinatory practices. Which brings us back to our timeline. By the 1780s, the German Tarok deck had become the primary deck for playing the tarot type games everywhere in Europe except for Italy. It's also important to note that the tarot game had never really made it to Britain or Ireland. So in English speaking countries, tarot has been associated with the occult pretty much since the decks were first introduced in the, in the early 1800s. For those not aware, occult means hidden and arcana means secret. As I explained in the last video, the term arcana is really specific to the occult divinatory purpose of tarot and is not used when describing them as playing card decks. If you saw the previous video, you know that the major arcana of the tarot was created in Italy around the same time that older esoteric information was being relearned in Europe. But there is no evidence that the cards were used as anything other than a playing card game at the time. This changed as the cards lost their original gaming purpose. This new occult way of looking at tarot started in France. Several people, all of them with ties to hermetic lodges, started relating the tarot to various other esoteric traditions, sometimes by matching the themes of the images, sometimes matching numerology, and sometimes changing things so that they matched a pattern that didn't really exist. In 1781, Antoine Cord de Gabalin wrote a book of history, history, called Le Monde Primitif, in which he made a number of assertions based not on any evidence, but that he thought they sounded cool. Um, and it is in this book that we see the first mention that the tarot cards come from Egypt. This was the guy, if you remember my first video of this series, I showed that Atlas Obscura quote making fun of mythology about tarot card sources. This is the French guy mentioned in there that they were making fun of. But you say, in the first video you told us the Mamluk cards did come from Egypt. Yeah, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the minor arcana which have a legitimate Egyptian influence, albeit a medieval Islamic influence, not an ancient hieroglyphic influence. That's <laughs> putting that aside. He's talking about the major arcana which come from Italy. His assertion was the major arcana was a book of ancient secrets hidden as a game in Rome until being discovered in the 14th century. This is patently just not true. But why Egypt? Well, Europeans were fascinated with ancient Egypt. They thought it was cool and exotic and mysterious. And while they had a lot of respect for the Egyptian past, they had very little respect for its present. France was actively trying to colonize Egypt at this time, and Napoleon was able to invade and hold power for about three years, from 1798 to 1801. It was during this Napoleonic occupation, in 1799, that the Rosetta Stone was uncovered. But it wasn't until 1822 that it was deciphered, and so it was only after that point that anyone was able to read Egyptian hieroglyphs. Nevertheless, the Egyptian influence was very fashionable at the time, and many things were given a faux Egyptian flair to make them seem more exotic. Although the Egyptian story was nonsense, it proved very popular. I'm sure you've heard it recently. I had a debate about it in a Facebook group last week. While researching this video, I found a poker website that repeated it as absolute fact, along with a lot of other complete nonsense. Eliphas Levy was one of the biggest fans of this theory, and it is through him and his writing that it has come down to us today. More on him in a minute. It's unknown where or when cards first started to be used for divination. Both regular playing card decks and tarot decks have been used. For tarot, the Tarot de Marseille has long been the most popular deck to use for occult purposes. The first person to create a deck specifically for occult purposes was Jean-Baptiste Alliette in 1785. He was better known as Atelier. 
This was actually not his first foray into card divination. In 1770, he had written a book about using regular playing cards for divination. But he was inspired by Gabalen to create his own deck. The Italia deck makes a lot of changes to the Tarot de Marseille standard. He reordered the cards. In fact, he numbered all of the cards, 1 through 78, and did not split the majors from the minors. And he changed many of the names and the iconography, getting rid of some of the more iconic symbolism of the Tarot de Marseille and replacing them with images that meant something to him personally. Because these were so personal, they didn't really catch on widely but not for lack of trying. Atelia created a correspondence course for tarot, then he taught students for many, many years across the world. Although his system faded into relative obscurity, Atelia is also known for being the first person to make a career out of being a celebrity tarot card reader. He also introduced the practice of reading reversals and having spreads with set meanings to the tarot world. And in time, many of his interpretations have made it into the popular understanding of how we interpret tarot cards. Okay. So for many years, if you were reading cards for divination, your choices were the Tower de Marseille or the Atelier deck. Then in 1856, Alphonse-Louis Constant, better known as Eliphas Lévy, I told you I'd get back to him, wrote his book, Dogma and Ritual of Transcendental Magic. This book combined for the first time all of Western esotericism into one cohesive overarching theory. And he used tarot as its glue. Ceremonial magic, astrology, alchemy, Kabbalah, it it was all there in some form. He took some liberties. As I mentioned before, he loved the idea of ancient Egyptian magic hidden in tarot. So he included a lot of that in his book as well. His attempts to bring tarot back to its fictional roots in Egypt are the reason that the high priestess wears the crown of Hathor and the chariot is drawn by sphinxes in the Rider Waite Smith deck. Levy also associated the 22 cards of the major arcana to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. He also mapped the cards to the tree of life. He was hugely influential in ceremonial magic and tarot. Despite the fact that he's not actually a very good writer, his writings are messy. They're very long and convoluted and rather dull to read. However, the people that he has inspired over the years have had much greater writing talent, and so it is through them that his ideas are still passed down to us. One of those people he influenced was a British occultist named Kenneth Mackenzie. Born in London, Mackenzie spent his childhood in Vienna and was fluent in English, German, French, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. From the 1850s to his death in 1886, he was the go-to translator for any English occultist who wanted a book in a foreign language that they could not read. In 1861, Mackenzie was in Paris and met Lévy. He translated Lévy's tarot writings into English, and these would become the book T, which is the cornerstone of the tarot teachings of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. One of the big changes that Mackenzie made to Lévy's work in this process of translation was that he moved the position of the Fool, giving it the number zero and putting it at the beginning of the deck. In the French system, the Fool had just been unnumbered and had actually been placed in the order between 20 Judgment and 21 The World. This meant that Lévy's system of Hebrew letter correspondences all shifted back one because now the Fool, not the Magician, was the first card in the deck. It's been 150 years and French and British occultists are still arguing about this. The French were not done innovating with Tara with the works of Lévy. In 1870, the Egyptian tarot by Jean-Baptiste Petois, better known as Paul Christian, was created. Where Lévy had added hints of Egyptian flavor to his cards, Christian went all in. Many of his additions to the iconography would prove very influential to later decks. And the Egyptian tarot has proved very popular. US Games still publishes a copy of it today. And in 1889, Oswald Wirth created the deck known as the 22 Secrets of the Kabbalistic Tarot. This majors only deck stuck closely to the Tarot de Marseille style, but added design improvements for the occult reader, such as adding the Hebrew numbers and astrological symbols to the cards themselves. He also gave the magician the tools of the suits, 
rather than the tools of a stage magician, as had been common in the Tower de Marseille style. However, despite all of this writing, the most popular deck of divination cards in France was actually the Lenormand, which was created from a completely different card game around 1800. This deck and this divination style didn't make it to English-speaking countries until very recently. Like, I heard about it in the last 10 years very recently. And so tarot has really remained in English-speaking countries the go-to deck for divination. In 1888, two years after Mackenzie's death, his writings were used as the basis for the creation of the Golden Dawn. And I'm gonna leave my comments to the Golden Dawn really specifically to Tarot at this point because the history of the rise and fall of that organization could really be a video or two of its own. Because of the fool changing position, the Golden Dawn also swapped strength and justice so that the correspondences would work better. At that point, the teachings of the Golden Dawn were oath-bound secrets. Novices learned tarot using mass market tarot de Marseille decks and weren't expected to hand draw their own deck as their tarot studies progressed. And honestly, this is a really great idea for anyone studying the tarot who really wants to get in touch with the nuances of the deck, regardless of your artistic abilities. In 1909, after the Golden Dawn had splintered, the most famous version of the tarot deck was created. Yes, we have finally, we have finally come to the creation of the Rider Waite Smith deck. Arthur Edward Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith had both been members of the Golden Dawn. But the Rider Waite Smith isn't technically a Golden Dawn deck. At the time of its creation, they had both bound by the vows they had taken when joining the order. So the book that Waite wrote, The Pictorial Key to Tarot, actually pulled a great deal from the writings of Atelier. And he instructed Smith to use the writings from Lévy and Constant in creating the artwork. Smith also used some imagery from the 15th century Italian Sola Busca deck, which was held at the British Museum, and she also channeled some of the images directly, leaving off the Hebrew letters, astrological symbols, and some of the more esoteric elements was a deliberate choice by Waite. He wanted to both distance the deck from other more occult decks that existed, and to try to get around the British anti-magic laws that existed at the time that would have made a more esoteric deck completely illegal to sell. The decision to go with this more universal look was a smart one, because it, the deck proved very popular for its original British publisher, Ryder. In 1916, the deck was pirated by a rather unscrupulous American publisher, and the deck proved popular in America as well. Tarot continued to gain popularity throughout the 20th century. In 1927, Worth published a book synthesizing Levy's ideas on tarot into a much more readable form. This book, The Tarot of Medieval Artists, has been hugely influential on modern tarot interpretations. Then, in 1937, Francis Israel Regardi worried that the teachings of the Golden Dawn would be lost because membership was declining. It had splintered in the early 1900s, it had reconstituted to several different orders, but none of them really picked off, none of them had the clout of the original version, and numbers were declining. So he just took it upon himself to go ahead and publish every secret that he had been given access to. One of these secret books that he had access to was the book T. Availability of this book to anyone who wanted it led to an increase of esoteric decks being created, however very few of which gained much popularity. One that has stood the test of time and definitely includes the Egyptian imagery is Aleister Crowley's Thoth deck. Although Lady Frida Harris painted these cards between 1938 and 1942, the deck was not published until the 1960s after both Harris and Crowley had died. Changes Crowley made included moving strength and justice back to their original Tarot de Marseille positions and also changing some of the names of the majors. Justice became adjustment, strength became lust, temperance became art, and judgment became aeon. The 1960s saw interest in tarot explode. In 1959, University Books had published the very first officially licensed Rider Waite Smith deck in the US. The next year, Eden Gray published Tarot Revealed, a modern guide to reading the tarot cards. 
This was a modern, straightforward manual for reading the tarot. It made cards accessible to the general public and stripped away a lot of the esoteric meanings in favor of using your own experiences. This was the birth of the intuitive tarot movement. And in the half decade since, this method has become increasingly popular. While many people still prefer to use book definitions, whichever book you happen to learn from, because every person I've mentioned in this video has had different interpretations of the cards, many other people don't read the books at all and draw their interpretations strictly from looking at the images. And so here we are, 2,000 years of tarot history, and what conclusions can we draw? Personally, my conclusion is that all approaches to tarot are valid. If you want to collect them for the art, lots of historical precedent for that. If you want to use them to play a card game and gamble with them, that's the original purpose. And if you read tarot for spiritual or magical purposes, there's no one right way to do it. Every tarot reader comes at the cards from their own perspective. The right way for you to read tarot cards is the way that makes you feel comfortable and confident reading tarot cards. As I said in episode one, I don't think things need to be veiled in secrecy to be spiritually meaningful. I don't think things need to be ancient to have value. We need to respect the past, but we also need to respect new ways of seeing and continue to learn. I am so glad you joined me for this rather long journey into the history of tarot cards. I hope you're enjoying my channel. Please subscribe, like this video, and tell me what aspects of occult history you would like me to dig into next down in the comments. Thank you so much. I'll see you later.